Okay. Um, well, welcome. Thanks to come for coming to the um, January meeting of the Upper Missisquoi and Trout Rivers Wild and Scenic Committee. We have these monthly meetings, and this winter we are going to be doing sort of brief presentations on some interesting topics about our rivers um, to sort of kick off those meetings. Tonight, we have um, Michael Lou Smith, who's going to be presenting about mussels in the Missisquoi, freshwater mussels. His project was funded by one of our river community grants last year in partnership with uh, between his employer, Arrowwood Environmental, and the Missisquoi River Basin Association. And I'm just going to turn it right over to Michael. I'm going to hit mute all on the rest of us and myself. And take it away, Michael. All right, thanks, Lindsay. I'm going to uh, share my screen here. And um, hello to everyone. And, uh, and thanks for giving me the opportunity to uh, talk about the work that I did this past summer. Uh, let's see here. All right. Can everyone see that? We're good? OK. Uh, so. The uh, 2021 Upper Missisco and Trout River Wild and Scenic Freshwater Mussel Inventory. Um, I'm, I, I think folks have had a chance to look at the report. And basically what I'm going to do is um, go through, give you kind of a brief introduction to freshwater mussels, what they are, how they live, uh, talk about the, the methods I used in the study, and then talk about some of the results. Um, this picture over here, you can see there's uh, a whole bunch of freshwater mussels um, amidst the rocks. Um, a lot of times you see them kind of vertical like this um, when they're siphoning. I'll show more pictures of that as well. Um, and this, the white on here is uh, shell erosion. Oftentimes the more acidic waters will erode some of their shells. And so that's pretty diagnostic as well. So freshwater mussels, what are they? Taking the big picture, look back, um, they are mollusks, okay? So they're related to clams and snails and squids, okay? And they're bivalves um, you know, related to the, the you know, marine species of mussels that people love to eat. Uh, and people always ask, well, can you eat these fresh, the freshwater mussels? And yeah, you can, but after you eat one, you won't want to eat them again, right? They're uh, okay, to be honest, I have not tried one because I've been warned off, but I, um, the word on the street is that they taste a lot like mud, so uh, not highly recommended, maybe keep you from starving. Um, so what, what do they look like? So basic biology is you've got um, the, the shell, the two, two sides of the shell, and they're basically protecting the, the uh, soft parts of the animal. Um, the foot kind of comes out one end and that's what they use to anchor themselves and bury themselves in the substrate, okay? Sometimes you can even see, not so much in rivers, but in lakes, they'll, they'll make a little track through the, the sand on like a sandy beach um, as they move around. Um, in rivers, they the foot is generally used to keep them from being washed downstream, okay? So they typically will bury themselves partway, sometimes all the way in, into the into the sediment. They are basically filter feeders. So they have an in-current um, siphon and an ex-current siphon. So constantly they're just pulling water in and they're filtering out phytoplankton, zooplankton, organic material, um, and then spitting out everything they don't want. Okay. Uh, and so being filter feeders, um, they are very sensitive to water quality. So they're basically just moving a lot of water in. And if there's any pollutants, they're going to move those in as well. And so they're very sensitive to water quality. They also um, can enhance clarity and are um, uh, really good kind of uh, filters of the water, such that somebody in the Delaware River <clears throat> had two tanks with the same water uh, basically taken right out of the river. And one of them had freshwater mussels in, one didn't. Okay. Um, and after a few number of hours, this is, this was the result. So you get an idea about what's, you know, the, the kind of potential for filtering that some of these mussels have. So the life cycle of mussels, this is one of the most fascinating things about them. Uh, they, let me just here. <clears throat> so we see that 
uh, male and female in the sediment here. The male will release sperm <clears throat> into the water column. Female will siphon that in, just like they're siphoning everything else in. Okay? And then they will fertilize the eggs and the gravid female will then release these things called glochidia, which are um, small, um, they're not, they're, they're not um, fully formed adults. They're a different form. They have to go through a metamorphosis. But these glo glochidia attach onto a fish host, onto their gills. And they're basically parasitic on the fish for as long as they're on there. Um, it could be a month or two months or even more in some cases. And so they grow basically feeding off the fish until they metamorphose into a, the adult stage and then they drop off, okay? And, and, they, and then they anchor themselves in the sediment. Now, when you think about um, freshwater mussels in rivers, it makes a lot of sense that they have a fish host because if you're, a, if you're an animal that doesn't really move, move around very much uh, and you're in a river, how are you gonna colonize upstream? Right, like you could only really colonize downstream, and that's not going to get you anywhere, right? Uh, and so this this is a way for them to basically spread out all up and down the rivers, um, and this works great unless, of course, there's a bunch of dams where the fish can't, you know, migrate up. Um, and it works great if you have healthy fish, fish populations as well. And so you can see there's another way that the freshwater mussels are kind of uh, intimately tied with, with the health of the river ecosystem. And it's not just because of they're siphoning in the water all the time, but it's also because they're linked to other members of the, of the um, ecosystem. And some freshwater mussels are kind of more generalist and they'll, they will attach onto pretty much any fish host. Some are a lot more specific. And they have just one or two species of fish that they will use as a host. Okay. Here's a picture of um, uh, the creeper mussel, which we'll talk about more. And you can see on the bottom with the frills, this is the inhalant um, siphon, and then the top is the exhalant. Okay. Now, uh, you might ask, how do they get the fit? How do they get these glochidia on the fish? So in some cases, they will send out a kind of a long mucus strand that when a fish kind of comes up into it, it, it will burst and the fish, as the fish breathes, um, it will breathe in this glochidia. Um, in other circumstances, they have um, lures that they put on a long kind of mucus strand that looks like a fish, okay? And the fish will attack it. Um, in some cases, uh, with some mussels, they will actually um, change the shape of their their body to look like a lure. Okay, and so to look like a, a a fish, you can see the little eye spot, and they'll even wiggle it some. And so a fish will come and think it's food, go to bite it, and then poof, it'll get a, a face full of these glochidia. Okay. It's, it's a really fascinating process. I have a, a quick little video here from the Fish and, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that I will show you. <laughs> so the fish, um, basically, instead of getting a meal, gets a mouthful of these glochidia, okay? Um, and depending on what type of fish the muscle uh, uses as a host, it will adapt its uh, lure to be a prey for that fish species. Okay. So that's um, kind of basic biology of some of the uh, freshwater mussels. Where are they in Vermont? Uh, you can see the map here, and this is from a 1995 study, which we'll talk a little bit more about where they inventoried freshwater mussels throughout the state. Uh, you'll notice all along the Champlain Valley and its tributaries is kind of a hot spot for freshwater mussels. Okay? There's a bunch in the Connecticut as well, and some of those tributaries. Um, notice kind of a conspicuous lack in the, in the spine of the Green Mountains, right? So these 
um, those high mountain streams, headwater streams, not great habitat uh, for freshwater mussels. And we'll all I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, you can also see this list of, these are all the species in the state. There's 18 of them. And uh, most of them are listed as rare, threatened, and endangered. Uh, so, you know, some, some researchers have, have consider freshwater mussels to be the one of the most imperiled um, fauna groups on the planet, uh, because it's not just Vermont where the lists look like this. Uh, it is kind of all over the place. Um, and oddly enough, the uh, uh, central um, United States and Midwest and the southern Midwest uh, is the world's hot, biological hotspot for freshwater mussels. Uh, there's more species, there's hundreds and hundreds of species there, uh, more species there than anywhere else in the world. Um, and Vermont is funny because we get some of those species as part of the Great Lakes system, and then some different, completely different species as part of the Connecticut River system. So kind of dialing down here on the Massisquoi, what species would we expect to find? So these are all the species that are that are known in the Massisquoi. And some of them, however, just below, you know, further below the fall line, further towards Lake Champlain. And that has a lot to do with, with the fish species that they um, are, that are host to them, and also kind of river habitat in those areas. Okay. But the ones we would expect to find uh, within our study area are outlined in orange here. So just really quick about um, river habitat with freshwater mussels. You know, these headwater streams, they're, uh, they're really flashy. Uh, so they have really high highs and really low lows and uh, have really unstable sediments and high flows. So these are generally not uh, really, there's not a lot of diversity of mussels. Sometimes there's no mussels in these areas. Um, in this kind of zone two transfer zone in this, in this diagram, you start to pick up a lot more species. And then in the um, lower reaches, you know, your, your diversity even goes even higher. Right? And a lot of it has to do with, I mean, there's two, the two main factors that um, kind of determine where a mussel bed or mussel individual is going to survive in a river have to do with um, set a stable sediment, they need stable sediments and flows that aren't too extreme. Um, so oftentimes, if you have, she, you know, just the sheer force of, of, of the flow will, um, Make it make a certain site un, unsuitable for mussels. So this is our study area, uh, the lower end of the wild and scenic river area, uh, up to uh, Route 105 here. So the the method for this was uh, basically I, I kayaked the river and look looking for uh, freshwater mussels. Uh, there are kind of freshwater mussels throughout the area at pretty low abundance. Uh, so, you know, less than, you know, one or one quarter per square meter or something like that. Um, you know, it's not uncommon to find just two mussels scattered here and there, but what we were really looking for is mussel beds. So concentrations of mussels, areas where the habitat is, is really suitable, suitable and there's high abundance. Okay. Um, so this white bucket, uh, you can't really see, but it has a clear bottom on it. And that's often used to kind of look underneath currents. Uh, this past summer flows were so low that I didn't really need it. Um, you know, it was, it was pretty shallow on the, on the banks and, um, and could just look down in, into the water without the use of that. Uh, there were two types of, of inventories that uh, methods that we used to inventory. One was time search. And that's basically if I come across an area that looks like it might have good muscles, I'll get out, set a timer and start looking for muscles and record the number I see of each species during a set time. Okay. And that um, enables you to compare. It's, it's, it's a qualitative study because if someone um, else did the same thing, they might come up with different numbers. It's it's um, not hard and fast numbers, but it does give you a good um, kind of idea about overall abundance. It also is the preferred method if you're going to find any 
diversity, okay, or looking for rare species, because you're, you're kind of looking over a broad area. And just so you know, this was um, one of the creeper mussels, and you can see its foot extended here. Um, typically, uh, it, it won't be lying in the river like this. I had sampled it, pulled it up, and, and then put it back. Um, usually when I put mussels back, I'll, I'll, um, you can bury them in the sediment, um, but this one had its foot out, and so I didn't want to crush it in there. Um, so the other type is quantitative plots. And you can see here, this was, you know, I lay out a, a, um, a transect, the tape, tape measure, and then um, pick some random numbers and, and choose, set some plots up along that transect. Um, once I've already established, okay, this area is a mussel bed. So this is a one square meter plot and I get in there and basically take all the muscles out, um, identify them to species and measure them. Okay. Uh, I also kind of excavate some of the sediment. So maybe, you know, a few inches down. And the reason I do that is that uh, some muscles, especially young muscles, like to bury themselves, you know, somewhat deep in the sediment. And so this, this is a more quantitative method. So I know exactly how many muscles per square meter averaged over the, the, uh, the number of plots that I did. So here's a map of the muscle beds that uh, are created from this. Uh, you can see they're kind of scattered throughout. Here, this is most of this bank um, along Route 105 is all riprap. And so it's not very good habitat. Uh, and some places, they, um, you know, just because of depositional zones and where the river is really fast, you know, you don't have, you don't have a lot of mussel beds. Um, and that's, and that's pretty, that's pretty um, natural for that to happen. Okay. So we found three different species and the most um, abundant one was the elliptio. And the elliptio is, uh, the most common mussel species in the eastern United States and in Vermont. Um, it's a generalist. Uh, it prefers wide range of habitats, um, has a number of fish hosts. Uh, and so that's why it's kind of the most common. Um, the, the creeper mussel uh, it was, was uncommon. In, and then the uh, triangle floater was pretty rare in the, in the study area. So this is um, um, a table of the results of time searches. And I know it's a lot. Um, I just really want you to focus on some of the, the orange uh, cells here. So this is the, with, with time searches, you kind of break it out by how, the standard is, you know, how many muscles did you encounter, encounter per person hour of searching? Okay, and so that's what these numbers are. Um, so it's pretty wide range, right? Like 15, the low, to 540, okay? Uh, that's a lot of muscles. <laughs> well, and that's muscle bed P. We'll come back to that one in a little bit. Um, these others were also quite high, which is good. Uh, you know, that tells me that you've got some, some pretty abundant muscle beds uh, in, in these locations. Um, this is highlighted because if you look at um, overall, throughout here, the ratio of elliptio to creeper, um, it's pretty significant. Like elliptio is by far and away the most common one in each of these beds, except the one that is highlighted. Uh, and this is uh, bed G. Uh, and that is this upper picture here. It's, it's an interesting site because it's kind of on the edge of a gravel bar uh, and pretty shallow. Uh, and almost all gravel substrate. And I've seen this before in other parts of the Missisquoi as well, where that tends to be the, the habitat that the uh, creeper prefers more than the elliptio. And so it, it you know, was nearly half the um, abundance uh, in that area. Most of the other ones obviously were, were dominated by elliptio. And, and Lindsay and Sarah were out with me one day and, and they can attest to that. That's, I think that's all we saw when, when, when they were helping me. Um, so. That's right here. And you can see this is the only muscle bed really that I documented that's not right against the bank. Okay. Most of the muscle beds we're seeing here and in rivers in, um, in this 
part of the country anyway, are up against the bank. And that has to do a lot with um, lower um, shear force from the flows. Um, and in, in many cases, you know, stable sediments there as well. So um, also of note, um, pretty the two largest muscle beds are um, D here and then I. And I, this is Lindsay, this is the one that you were working on with me. Okay. So the quantitative plots, uh, you can see the average average number of muscles per square meter from the plots. Also a pretty wide range. Uh, you know, this kind of two to four range is pretty typical for, um, you know, standard uh, a muscle bed that, you know, you, you'll see in the, in the state. 26, that's, that's a pretty dense muscle bed. Um, and that is, that's muscle bed P also had the highest um, from the time search. And that's down here just above the the, the falls there in the rapids. Okay. You can see this is a picture of that muscle bed and it's here against this bank, kind of like that. Okay. So because uh, we were measuring uh, a lot of the muscles, we were able to get some information about the population demographics. And this is important because you want to know, you know, do you have good representation of young uh, muscles as well as kind of middle age and old muscles okay and you can see this this bell curve that we have for liptio it's just what you want to look at i mean just what you want to see okay we've got um some younger ones and then a few that are you know getting pretty sizable okay um i expect that these numbers are generally lower than the actual numbers just because small muscles are hard to find Okay, uh, because they bury themselves and they they can be pretty small. Okay, so so but in general, this is this is the kind of thing you want to see. Right? So that's for the elliptio, and this is for the um, creeper muscle. And you can see a couple things, a couple differences here. Um, one is that I these lower categories, I don't have any samples i didn't i didn't detect any and that's in part because i didn't find any of these in in the quantitative plots so i didn't i wasn't digging when i found these these were all from the time searches okay so i suspect that there are some of the younger ones there i just didn't didn't find them the other thing you'll notice is that this is kind of shifted to the left right like so the the most we have is in this 61 to 70 length whereas in the most in here is the 81 to 90. Um, and that's not surprising either, because this species in general just doesn't get as big. Okay, it's a smaller species, uh, and so this. But but so overall, I think for both of these, it was encouraging to see this kind of this bell bell shaped curve. Okay. So that's the the data that I collected, and um, you know, in the report, I, I tried to explore a little bit about like what does it mean, right? Now, if we had quantitative data from 20, 30, 50 years ago, we could tell you pretty conclusively what it means. Uh, but we don't have that. Um, and in the absence of that, um, you know, we do the best we can. And so this 1995 inventory of um, the mus freshwater mussels of Vermont didn't include any quantitative, but it was basically did include what species am I finding where? Okay. And they did have one um, sample location in the study area at the mouth of the Trout River, okay, on the Missisquoi. Uh, and what they, they found there was three species, Liptio, Creeper, and the Triangle Floater, okay. So uh, that's good. Uh, that means that basically our diversity hasn't gone down since 1995. Okay? Uh, we don't know uh, relative abundance from 1995. They just gave us numbers. I mean, they just gave us species. Uh, so it's hard to know if, you know, the creeper and the triangle floater are a lot more rare now or even more common now. Um, I suspect they're a little more rare now. In particular, the triangle floater, um, just not seeing it as much as I think people used to see it. Um, and so that's it's kind of a little bit of a concern. Um, the other uh, interesting one was that they didn't find creek heel splitter. I didn't find the creek heel splitter in, in the reach that I looked at, but it has been found downstream fairly recently. 
And in the 95 survey, they found it on a tributary upstream. And so um, it may be there. Um, if it is, it's, pr it's pretty rare. Uh, certainly the habitat is right, but it's also one of the more uh, rare mussels. So certainly the rarest of in even range, range wide in the state, it's the rarest of those four. So um, Lindsay had just informed me that we did get funding for the next working upstream. So maybe I'll find it there. <laughs> okay, so the other um, piece of data that we have is from the lower Missisquoi. Uh, also from uh, that kind of time range. And um, they did a little bit of uh, quantitative work. Uh, elliptio is very common down there as well. And you know their median was 2.76 muscles per square meter, which is about what you know the range that we were looking at. Okay, they did have some mussel beds that were a lot more dense than than I found. Uh, not entirely surprising. Um, the habitat is a little different down there. There's more kind of suitable mussel habitat down there. There's also a lot more diversity. I think I showed you that all the species that are found in Missisquoi, well, they're all found down there. Um, and so it's um, it's not a perfect comparison, but it's something. Uh, and so you know that kind of indicates that you know our 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 muscle density um, is you know within the range of what we would hope for. Okay. Um, and you know finally looking at the Lamoille, uh, just because there's kind of similar similar geomorphology to the Missisquoi, you know, um, where our study area was. Uh, and this was a study from 2020, and we, you know, the, the quantitative plot that we had there was 6.23 muscles per square meter. So again, you know, it's a little higher, but kind of in the range. Okay, certainly um, in this stretch of river in the Lamoille that, that I was inventorying in 2020, um, we didn't have any muscle beds that were as dense as the ones that I found on on the Missisquoi in our study area. Okay. So uh, overall conclusions um, nine mussel beds that we mapped and assessed documented those three species. Uh, the triangle floater was certainly the most rare. Uh, the, we found a healthy range of age classes for both the Liftio and creeper, which is encouraging. Um, the diversity has, has, is unchanged in this reach since 90, 1995. And uh, the abundance uh, appears to be pretty consistent with other data that we've collected historically on the Missisquoi and on the Lamoille. Okay. Uh, all right. So I will stop sharing my screen and we can see if there's any questions. Great. Uh, thanks so much for that, Michael. That was very fun information and um, I appreciate you just sort of raising my personal awareness about the critters that are in the river that I just float over and don't notice. So right, right. Um, <laughs> it's yeah. good to know that we have nine mussel beds in, in a relatively small part of our river. Um, and I guess that's a question I have. How does that compare, for instance, with the Lamoille, um, which is a very different, um, I don't really think, but it's a deeper river than ours. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it seems like to me, nine muscle beds seems like a lot in that couple mile stretch, but. Yeah, um, it's, I think it's, it's what I was hoping I would find. And so, um, I, I mean, just from my experience on, um, yeah, I think that it's, it's, um, it's hard because, you know, I think a lot, so much of it is dependent on river geomorphology and there's stretches of the Lamoille that I thought I would find more. And then other stretches where, you know, there was just a lot of them. And, um, and so I was overall though, I was, I was pleased that there was that, that many muscle beds and um, some of them quite dense. So. Good. Well, I'm, I'll be excited to see what you find this summer too, moving up, up river. Up river. Yep. <laughs> yep. So. Um, in the chat, we just had uh, Jamie said uh, he tried freshwater mussels once and they were terrible. So <laughs> that's a, a second. I'm going to take your word for it. 
Thanks for sharing your uh, experience, Jamie. <laughs> don't, don't try steaming them. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions for Michael? This isn't a question, but I, I was pleased. I'm a representative of Berkshire. And to think that you were talking about a couple of the uh, beds that were right along the um, Marvin and King Road. And so I, you know, it's will be worth my time going to the select board and saying, because of the funding, I'm sure we helped when we put in the new culvert and the importance of these little things that you um, sometimes just float over as you're paddling down the river so uh yeah so thank you that was that was really cool oh good yeah michael we have a, a question in the chat about the um accessibility of this information russ asked how will this report and the data be archived so they're available for other researchers and in the future and for one we'll have it um on our website russ but <laughs> michael yeah and um Right. It, so it, it does belong to you folks. And um, typically we you know, request that we can also share it with the state natural heritage program. Um, and they are the ones that hold uh, kind of the gatekeepers of a lot of the data um, on non game species. Uh, and so it would basically go into their database. Um, so and that's I think that's probably a, um, a really valuable kind of addition to their database. Great. All right. Well, I was also pleased, or I, yeah, I guess pleased is the right word to see one of the muscle beds, the one that you were talking about right above um, the Sampsonville Rapids, uh, because there's this committee is hopefully going to be a part of getting some of the old dam debris out of that space. And that's mm -hmm. something that we'll need to consider for bringing heavy equipment in. Yeah. Um, make sure that we don't disrupt that. So great yeah. to have that mapped and know that it's there. Oh, good. Yeah. All right. Any other questions before we move on to the business portion? No, no question, but I'd like to go next year, at least one day, if I know in advance. Sure. It was cool to be out in the river with Michael and see these guys. Yeah, I'll put you to work though if you come. <laughs> I'm I'm retired, so I can do all the work I want. Okay. <laughs> Me too. I'd also like to go. Sure. Yeah. Great. I'm going to stop the recording and just uh, with okay. one more. Thank you so much, Michael. Appreciate it. All right. Yeah. Thank you.